or tapes of end-time meetings, deliverance services, or Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds publication, Voices from His Excellent Glory, Declaring the Kingdom, writes Post Office Box 21516, Hot Springs National Park, Arkansas, zip 71903. Thursday evening, May the 26th, 1983. First service of the Memorial Weekend Deliverance and Teaching Seminar being held at Lake Hamilton Bible Campgrounds, Hot Springs, Arkansas. Win Worley is the main speaker of the evening. Father, we thank you for the presence of the Holy Ghost here tonight and over this weekend. We praise you for it. I praise you for it. I thank you for it. We thank you for an outpouring of your Spirit as we come to praise and to worship and to magnify the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords. Jesus is his name. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Praise the name of the Lord. Father, we thank you for the anointing to rest over the music and over the speakers and over all of us as we praise and worship and magnify thee. Praise the name of the Lord. Father, we thank you for glory and victory in our hearts and in a, and a shout in the camp. We praise you for it tonight. We praise you for it. Praise the name of the Lord. Hallelujah, hallelujah, hallelujah. Praise you, Jesus. Uh, we've had some interesting brushes of the enemy. Uh, according to the enemy, we're making headway. They are very deeply distressed. I tangled with one in New York City recently, a couple weeks ago, and I said... Uh, How's everything going on your side? <laughs> he said, I don't want to talk to you. I got so unsocial. And, uh, I, well, I wanted to talk, so I poked him up a little bit. And he, he said, I don't know, Early, you stupid idiots have messed up everything. I hope you're one of the idiots that helped mess it up. You see, binding and loosing and casting out devils across the country has literally thrown the enemy's plans into utter chaos. We're supposed to be in an economic depression, not recession, right now. The bottom is supposed to have fallen out. The new money is already supposed to have been issued at two or three different points. Binding and loosing has stopped it, people, dead in its tracks. So by all means, hang in there and battle harder. And if you don't know what we're talking about, you find out before you leave the campgrounds. And if you don't know what we're talking about, you find out before you leave the because it's a, there's a thin line of a few hundreds of people across the country who have caught a vision of doing spiritual warfare while they're washing dishes, while they're driving a truck, while they're pushing the vacuum cleaner, while they're rocking the baby. You don't have to sell your house. You don't have to go away to school. You don't have to do any of those things. You can be right where you are and knock the living hound out of the devil. There's been too much of this business. Oh, oh, I see it. Oh, yes. Oh, praise God, sister, you've got a ministry. Yes, yes, I see it. Oh, it's worth it all. Multitudes are waiting for you out there. Go sell your house. Go sell your car. It's worth it all. Give me half. Go to school. And people, there's been too much of that garbage going on. That's religious huckstery. That's huckstery of the worst, rottenest sort. And I don't hesitate to tell you I don't have any use for anybody like that. Where you are, in school, at home, at work, you can battle the enemy and do it successfully. And this is the message that is getting out to God's little people, if you want to call them that. They're God's dynamite. The big people are not doing that much that I can find. They're busy doing other things. They're posturing and keeping their programs going. God's little people don't want to seem to have any interest in what God wants done. Thank God for people who will bind and loose and attack the enemy. God is continuing to reveal things in deliverance. It's like an unfolding revelation leading into what God is doing in this age in which we live. Now, if you're not flexible enough to learn what God is doing, you better get flexible. The battle is waxing hot. We found out all kinds of neat things that just put all kinds of kinks in the enemy's plans that destroy him and put God's people in the saddle and give us the whip hand over the enemy. I like that, don't you? I'll tell you, for years, I was sick and tired of the devil trampling me, my people, and everybody I knew. Then I got sick and tired of being sick and tired, and it still didn't seem to do any good. But I found a way to get a handle on that rascal. And God said, you can't do it all, son. You've got to teach everybody you meet that'll listen how to do it. That's why I'm on the trail. I'm not here to impress you. There are no stars in the deliverance firmament except the bright morning star. In deliverance, it's all hard work. Everybody's a servant. Everybody's a worker. Some of us have been at it a little longer than others. But 
You're all workers. And I have no... And when you hear somebody say, I've been completely delivered. Run! Do not walk to the nearest exit. What they've got you don't want to catch. It's worse than the itch. Spell P-R-I-D-E. And I-G-N-O-R-A-N-C-E. Of the worst kind. There's a fellow running around the country now selling six cassettes and a certificate that you are a minister of deliverance. They might even know who he is. <laughs> well, making merchandise, huh? I figure the people who spend $40 on that deserve to get rooked if they don't know any better than that. Listen, whatever Jesus is doing, he'll do free for you people. Don't you get rooked into somebody who's huckstering God's gifts. Just stay, stay, stay away from those people. Amen? Some of you are looking peculiar now. You better get smart. In these last days, the hucksters are here. The religious racketeers are here. And some of them are just slick as glass. I heard one of them a couple of days ago on one of the famous broadcast telecasts. And he was giving forth as if it was a great new revelation. He said, I'll tell you, God is no longer going to put up with a man saying one thing and doing another. I thought, I've known that for 40 years, ever since I got saved. You just now finding out? And I thought of some things he'd done. I thought, I guess you are. And I thought, are you listening to yourself? Because he's a crook. He's fleeced people out of thousands and thousands of dollars. And he's up there trying to make it a new revelation that God will, will no longer put up with a man saying one thing and doing another. God never has put up with that. That's no news, is it? Nothing right. You don't need a revelation for that. It's already in here. Right? Amen. All right. I want to share with you something that has... You know, we've always known, to a degree anyway, that when the Bible talks about having a good inheritance, how important it is to have a good inheritance. But I never realized until relatively recent months how critical it is, that good inheritance. If you have a good, godly inheritance, thank God for it. You've got something that can't be bought anywhere. I was in Hawaii, and I received a letter from a man and he gave me some things that had happened to him. And he said, Pastor, he said, I read your books and I've received a lot of deliverance. So has my wife. And we, our lives have been changed by it. But I kept running into some areas of my life where I wasn't getting any help. And when I fasted and prayed, the Lord seemed to lead me into a new area that I had never seen discussed anywhere in any of the books that I had seen. And he wrote to me and related three incidences. And then he said, I would like for you to... Tell me if I'm on the right track. If I'm off in left field, tell me. But they seem to have changed my life. He said while he was on the fast, the Lord led him to some scriptures. I want to read the scriptures first, and I want to relate three incidents he gave to me and tell you what happened. Uh, if you have a pencil now, jot these down because we're going to go rather rapidly. Write the numbers down first so you won't miss them. In Exodus 21, 23 through 35, uh, 25, excuse me. Exodus 21, 23, 24, and 25. You want to go back and review these later. Meditate on them. See if they say that. I beg your pardon. I don't want to start there. Just leave that one. We'll get to that one in a minute. That one's down the line a piece. Had my paper turned over. Start with Exodus 20, verse 5 and 6. We'll get to that other one a little later. Exodus 20, <laughs> verses 5 and 6. It's, of course, the great, uh, the Ten Commandments. Thou shalt not bow down thyself to them, speaking of idols nor serve them, for I, the Lord thy God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquities of the fathers upon the children to the third and fourth generation. Now, generations 40 years. So he's talking about 120, 160 years of judgment. And showing mercy unto thousands that love me and keep my commandments. All right? Mark that one down. Let's go on to Exodus 34, 6 and 7. Exodus 34, 6 and 7. The Lord... The Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering, abundant in goodness and truth, keeping mercy for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty. Mark that down. That's a significant statement. Forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin, and that will by no means clear the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children, and upon the children's children to the third and fourth generation. In Numbers 14, 18, Numbers 14, 18, the Lord is long-suffering and of great mercy, 
forgiving iniquity and transgression, and by no means clearing the guilty, visiting the iniquity of the fathers upon the children unto the third and fourth generation. Jeremiah 32.18 Jeremiah 32.18 Thou showest loving kindness unto thousands, recompensest the iniquity of the fathers, and to the bosom of their children after them, the great, the mighty God, the Lord of hosts is his name. In Lamentations 5.7 Our fathers have sinned and are not, that is, they're dead and gone, and we who are remaining have borne their iniquities. In Ezekiel 18, verse 7 and verse 30, Therefore, son of man, speak unto the house of Israel, and say to them, Thus saith the Lord God, Yet in this your fathers have blasphemed me, in that they have committed a trespass against me. Wherefore, say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, Are ye polluted after the manner of your fathers, and commit ye whoredoms after their abominations? Now, Exodus 21, 23 through 25. I'm going to go through a whole bunch of these. Then we're going to go back and, and uh, talk about the foundation we're laying. And if any mischief follow, then thou shalt give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burning for burning, wound for wound, strife for strife, and so forth. Now, this presents a pretty stern picture. He said, oh, that's in the Old Testament. We're delivered from the law. Uh-uh. In Galatians 3.13, we are redeemed not from the law, which is perfect, but from the curse of the law. There's a difference. All right? Now, in Leviticus 26, verses 36 through 42, this whole uh, 26th chapter of Leviticus is talking about a people who've been carried off into captivity because of their wickedness, and God is talking to them, and we pick it up at verse 36. And upon them that are left alive of you, I will send faintness into their hearts and the lands of their enemies, and the sound of a shaken leaf shall chase them. You have to be pretty frightened if a leaf rattling on the tree is going to make you spooked and cause you to run, isn't it? A shaken leaf will, uh, will cause them to flee. They shall flee as fleeing from a sword. They shall fall when none pursue it. They're going to literally run and hurt themselves trying to get away at the slightest noise. They're nervous wrecks. They're totally demoralized. And they shall fall upon one another as it were before sword, when none pursueth, and you shall have no power to stand before your enemies. They don't have any courage. They're totally wiped out, demoralized. And you shall perish among the heath, and in the land of your enemies shall eat you up. They that are left of you shall pine away in the iniquity of your enemies' lands. Also in the iniquities of their fathers shall they pine away with them. If they shall confess their iniquity and the iniquity of their father. With the trespass, they have trespassed against me, and that also they have walked contrary to me, and that I have also walked contrary unto them, and brought them into the land of the enemies. If then their uncircumcised hearts be humble, and they accept of the punishment of their iniquity, then I'll remember my covenant with Jacob, Isaac, covenant with Abraham I'll remember, and remember the land. Now very rapidly, I've sketched in a background I want you to see. The biblical basis for this. These are some of the verses that this man found when he was fasting and praying, seeking the answer to some questions that God, uh, he had not been able to answer, and getting some remedies that he had not been able to secure with what he knew about deliverance. The thing that started him on the trail of this, he had a problem with landlords. All his life, when he rented a place, he always had trouble with landlords. They ran him out of the place. They threw him out. They sold the property out from under him. Uh, he was always having trouble being evicted, asked to leave, and yet he was a good tenant. He tried to pay his rent on time. He tried to uh, keep the property up, and there was no particular reason. And yet he was over and over again, he went through this terrible thing of having to pull up stakes and move. That gets to be pretty distressing. As a matter of fact, I think he said in the first um, five years he's married, he had to move 12 times or something like that. That gets pretty old, you know. And they thought, well, maybe the Lord is just trying us, you know, and, and they tried to bear up under it, you know. But then after he got into deliverance and he found out about the demonic workings, he began to do this. They tried binding and loosing. That didn't help. They tried uh, breaking curses. That didn't seem to affect it that much. He was still having trouble. So he took it to the Lord in fasting and prayer, and the Lord said, it's sins of the fathers. Well, he didn't know what that was. So he got his concordance and began to chase scriptures, and he came up with some of these scriptures I've read to you. And as he 
stop us. He said, but Father, I don't understand. What do you mean? And he said, it's an eye for an eye and tooth for tooth. He said, your father was engaged in some real estate dealings at one time. He was in, uh, involved with the underworld. And he did some shady real estate dealings in which he made a lot of money. And a lot of people got hurt and gypped out of it. So you're the eldest son. Every time you come in contact with real estate, you have trouble. It says to the fathers, what your father did has passed on to you. You say, that's not fair. Well, now, where were you when the rules were made? That's what God asked Job, you know. Where were you when I fashioned the world? If you didn't like the way it was, you should have been here when I fixed it. Commented on it then. It's a little late now. Everything's all set up. We're, you know, the creator, creature has a terrible habit of rearing up against the Father and saying, this is not fair. Well, who are we to say what's fair? God called the rules, didn't he? Now, so he said, well, Lord, what shall I do? And the Lord led him to Leviticus 26. You'll find that here it talks about confessing the iniquities of the fathers as well as your own. And you'll also find that uh, Nehemiah did this and maybe one or two of the others. Daniel did this. Confess the iniquity of the fathers. Now, when he did this, he can, uh, you know, we have a perfect covering for all sin, don't we? First John 1 John 1.9. Did you ever hear that one? If we confess our sin unto him, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sin and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful and just to forgive. And we have the perfect answer because the blood of Jesus Christ blots it out. Isaiah 53 talks about him bearing our iniquities. Right? All our iniquities on him were laid. Now, but like so many things that we have discovered since working in deliverance and in spiritual warfare, we have great and mighty precious promises and benefits, but they are not automatic. They must be claimed specifically, individually, and scripturally. You don't just reach at random and grab them and say, Oh, goody, I heard I had some of these. Let me have that whole shelf full. No, you will claim them one by one and you'll do it according to scriptural order or you won't get them. They're yours. You're entitled to them, but you'll not have them unless you come and claim them according to the Scriptures. This man was led to pray then, and he confessed the sin of his father in cheating people in real estate deals. And he accepted the forgiveness of his father's sin. Now, that didn't help his father. He's praying for his benefit. He's the one that's getting shot down. Okay? Don't understand we're going into Catholicism here where we're getting indulgences or something. He is praying for the forgiveness of his father's sin. He is accepting the forgiveness of that sin in order to lift the curses, iniquities, and whoredoms off of himself and his descendants for three and four generations. Now, let me ask you this. Is that worthwhile? Amen. Well, of course it is. And some people say, well, I don't know why you have to do that. Well, you don't. You can just keep on being under those iniquities if you want to. There's nothing says you have to come out from under them. You can go ahead, suffer them, and let your children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren suffer. As a matter of fact, if you pick it up and do it yourself, you will perpetuate and start another four-generation cycle. You see, God is saying to us, hear my word and do what it says. I, I cannot believe the stubbornness and the contrariness of some of God's people when you call their attention to something like this and say, well, I know you see what I have to do then yet. I'm under the blood. Well, bless you. I don't know why people have to be so stubborn as not to meet God's simple condition. What could be simpler? Father, I confess my father's sin of being involved in crooked real estate dealings, and I accept forgiveness because Jesus paid for that wickedness. I accept that forgiveness. Now, in Jesus' name, I lift the curses, the whoredoms, and the iniquities off of me and off of my descendants. Because of my father's sin. Is that difficult? Is that hard to do? That's like saying, well, I don't know why I have to confess sin. God knows I'm sorry for it. Well, you have to because that's what he says. If we confess our sin, not if we're sorry for it, not if we say, well, Lord, you know how I feel. That reminds me of the little boy that was just learning to write. He'd just gone off to school. He's in the first grade and he'd learned to print. And so he, every night... When he went to bed, his mother had taught him to say the child's prayer, you know, now lay me down to sleep. Um, help me get up in the morning and eat. No, that's the grown folks' prayer. Uh, now lay me down to sleep. Uh, I pray the Lord my soul to keep. If I should die before I wake, 
uh, pray the Lord my soul to take. And he'd pray that little prayer every night, and then he'd hop in bed. He'd kneel down by the bed. Well, after he got in school he got and got to printing and learning how to print things, then he went to his mother, and he wanted her to help him uh, where he could print out that prayer. And so very laboriously he printed out that little child's prayer, four lines long, worked real hard. And then he went and stuck it up over his bed. He was very proud of it. He said, see, Mom, got it all up there. He said, yes, son, that's nice. So that night when he went to bed, he started to kneel down. And he, thought, he looked up there and saw it and said, them was my sentiments and hopped in bed. Now, that's the way a lot of people are, isn't it? They're looking for an easy way. Oh, does it have to be so hard? I had one lady that had been all involved in witchcraft, and uh, she came up to me and she said, I'd like to get the rest of my deliverance. I think she'd had 15 minutes for her. And I said, well, this life will take several seconds. She said, well, why does it take so long? I said, because you've been mean as a snake, that's why. <laughs> don't you ask me a question if you don't want to know. Especially if you're trying to rush God into something instead of being... You ought to be thankful to God. He's got a remedy for this mess. We ought to be saying, praise you, Lord. I'll do anything you say. I'll crawl on my knees if that'll do any good. But it won't. But we just meet His conditions. And they're so simple, so plain, so easy. And they're legal, and they'll break the devil's hold off of you. Why not take the easy way? This man said immediately, not the deliverance like he had known in the past, where things happened inside of him, but the circumstances around him changed. His environment began to change. And he no longer faced the hostility of the landlord. It was like the difference between night and day. Well, he was greatly encouraged. He had another problem area. Ever since he had been grown up, he had had to rent places to live, and it seemed that he was never able to get an adequate place. Every place he rented, the apartment was too small, the trailer was too small, he was always confined, everything was just stacked up on top of everything, there just wasn't enough room, and it was always crowded, always crowded. And he talked to his wife, he said, you know, I wonder if that's, if that's something demonic. So he asked the father, he said, it's sins of the father. He said, but Lord, I don't understand. How could that be involved with my father? And his dad told him something that he didn't know about. He said, your father was married before he married your mother. And out of that union, there was a son produced. When that son was a little toddler, the doctor said he is hopelessly mentally retarded. And your father took him, put him in an asylum, and he was locked up. And that boy has been locked up in a small room all of his life. You are the eldest son of the second marriage. And what your father did to your brother has passed on to you. Ooh. Yes, uh, you can just hear the brain wheels whirling when I get going on this thing. You haven't seen nothing yet. Wait, we'll dig into the scripture on this. It gets worse or better, whichever way you want to look at it. It gets worse because we see the problem. It gets better because we see the answer. All right. So he prayed again and he said, Well, Father, I confess the sin of my father in mistreating my brother and uh, abusing him and having him confined. And I claim forgiveness and I accept it because of First John 1, 9. Because you've cleansed and forgiven. Now I lift the, the curses, the iniquities, the whoredoms off of me that my father's sin may have brought to me. In Jesus' name. Again, he said it was the difference between night and day. Suddenly the circumstances around him changed and he was able to get an adequate place to live for the first time. He said it was just... He said, Pastor, I don't know how to explain it to you. It was just like a whole new world. And it was just almost instantly. He said it was an environmental change. It was a change in the situation around me. And then he said there was another area that I had trouble with, and that was the area of authority. It seemed that every time I got into an area where I had somebody in authority on me, over me, they were always coming down on me. The bosses always chewed me out. I couldn't seem to please them. And I work hard, and I try to be diligent. I was a Christian. I try to be a good testimony, good worker. And yet, you know, uh, they'd miss the drone right beside me and come chew me out for not doing what he didn't do, you know. And I'd done my part. And it just seemed like I always got singled out for special pressure from authority figures over me. I went to the Father. I said, Father, what is causing this problem in the, the authority situation? And the Lord said, it's sins of the fathers. He said, well, I don't understand. He said, I don't know that my father ever had any problems like that. He said, he didn't. 
He said, your ancestors lived in the southern part of the United States. They were involved in the slave trade. And they abused and misused the slaves that were under them. And consequently, every time you come into contact with authority, you are abused and oppressed. It's sins of the fathers. <coughs> well, by this time, of course, he knew the trail. So he immediately confessed the sins of his ancestors that he didn't even know. He knew nothing about that. He had no way to know it except the father just revealed it to him. He confessed that sin of his ancestors, and he accepted forgiveness in Jesus' name for what they had done to mistreat and abuse people under them, and lifted the curses, iniquities, and whoredoms off of himself and off his descendants. And again, the pressure lifted off of him and has remained off sin. I say that now when I got this letter, I got excited. But I thought in my mind, I kept thinking in the back of my mind there were a couple of scriptures that might mess that whole thing up. Because I kept thinking about a scripture I'd read somewhere, a couple of them, that said the child wouldn't be punished for his father's sin. So I got, I spent a whole day in Hawaii with the strong concordance. I ran every reference on sins of the father. And I found the ones I was thinking about in Ezekiel, and they didn't conflict. Because it said the child would not be put to death for his father's sin. That's different. Now, uh, let's go to the scriptures now and take a look at some scriptural patterns. This will help you to understand why God gave such detailed studies of the families in the Bible. Because the sins of the fathers multiply over and over again. Did you ever wonder why? Well, I'll get to that. Did you ever wonder why God could say long before they were born, Jacob have I loved and Esau have I hated? It was sins of the fathers. God knew how it was going to turn out. I'll show you that in a minute. We'll get down to them in a little bit. Let's start Genesis 3. Just jot down Genesis 3. I'm not going to re refer to specific verses, but just the area. And uh, the serpent, of course, was judged. You remember that. He had exalted himself above God. He refuted the word of God. And he was to be abased as a judgment. He was abased below all other creatures. He seduced Eve to eat the fruit. He was forced to eat dust. He talked her into rebellion against God. And from that day to this, there's been no communication between snakes and humans. By the way, I, I can't prove this, except it seems to me to be kind of obvious that the serpent was the only creature that could talk. You say, how do you know that? Because Eve didn't climb the tree when the serpent spoke to her. I mean, you know, when I was growing up, we had a cow. I'd go out and milk her, and it wasn't always a pleasant job, especially on cold, cold mornings. I talked to her quite a bit. You know, I'd tell her different things, and inform her, get over, and I'd talk to her. But you know, if she'd have turned around and said, Now, Willie, how come are you doing that? I'd have taken off across the fence to get a better look at a distance <laughs> because cows are not supposed to talk. And that would have shocked me out of my socks if she'd have turned around and started talking to me. But Eve didn't react at all like that when the serpent spoke to her. And no record of any other creature speaking other than Adam. And uh, at any rate... They haven't been talking since then. Whatever ability this, the serpent had was taken away from him. Look at Eve. She brought sorrow to God about his children. His children were Adam and Eve. Her sin brought God sorrow. She was to have sorrow about her own children. Her sin led to the natural death of mankind. Therefore, she was to produce life. Conception was to be multiplied to replace those who would be killed by the curse. She decided to rebel all alone. Therefore, from henceforth her decisions... Her desires were to be subject to her husband's approval. Now, I look at Adam. He was the big cheese. He had the stronger conscience. He was the one responsible. He should have said no and didn't. Eve was deceived. She thought he was the serpent was telling the truth. Adam knew better and did it anyway, so his sin was worse. He disobeyed the command to eat, so in sorrow would he eat henceforth. He troubled God's garden, and so he had trouble after that. He was to earn his living by the sweat of his face. All the judgments on him related to food. He got a dose of his own medicine. Now, in Genesis 4, uh, we find the first starting of the sins repeating. Sins of the Father start their repeating. Now, God's son was Adam, right? His eldest son. God's son rebelled and dishonored his father, right? Guess what? Genesis 4, Cain was the eldest son. He rebelled. And dishonored his father. See, the sins of the father is already starting to work. Now, Cain's descendants kept moving on into wickedness. 
They were they worked in the flesh, producing Lamech, who introduced polygamy and murder. You find that in Genesis 4. As a matter of fact, the human race got worse and worse, and the devil thought he had won. <laughs> you know, I have to give the devil credit. He really is plucky. God has knocked the daylights out of him time and time again, and he thinks he gets everything set up to win, where he thinks for sure this time he's got everything done. He had it all going his way. He got a hold of uh, Abel, was the man who was doing things right, so he would be the obvious choice for the seed. Cain was rebellious, and rotten religion rose up and killed the truth. By the way, the Hebrew kind of indicates how he, how he killed him, too. He tore his throat out. Because the word slew is the same word used when a wolf leaps for the uh, lamb's throat and rips it out. He, he got so angry that he, he probably just ripped his jugular vein out. I don't think he hit him on the head. I think he tore his jugular vein out. He was really mad. You say, wow. Have you ever seen somebody in rotten religion get crossed? That same spirit will come at you. Spirit of Cain. All right. So Cain went on, got worse and worse. He said, my punishment's greater than I can bear, but he had to bear it anyway. By the way, you cross God like that, and you can holler all you want to that you can't bear it, but you will. He did. Now, the devil said, ha, 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 I got it all fixed up, got it all messed up. Now how are you going to produce the seed? God said, ha, 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 I got a surprise for you. Here comes Seth, toot, toot, and he comes right around him, right down the track. Here comes the birth of Seth, and after the birth of Seth, men began to again call on the name of the Lord. And Seth was the new one that God produced, a new bloodline. That's in Genesis and uh, uh, Genesis 5. In Genesis 6, Noah comes on the scene. In Genesis 9, you'll find Ham, who violated an unwritten law that was later incorporated into the written law, against observing his father's nakedness. And there's something more than that involved here, probably uh, sexual confusion. And uh, the thing that happened, Ham did this, and Noah immediately cursed him when he woke up. And he cursed Ham, and it fell on Canaan, Ham's son. Sins of the father. It's already starting to roll. And Canaan was cursed with his descendants, and they became foul, perverted idolaters. They were the inhabitants of Sodom and Gomorrah in Genesis 19. You remember when the Israelites came back from uh, the prom, uh, from Egypt? They were ordered to destroy the Canaanites, to utterly destroy them. They were foul and wicked. And that's the long-lasting effects of sins of the fathers. Now, in Genesis 16, look at Abraham. I'm just skimming through this. You'll really find a treasure trove when you dig into David and Solomon. I'm not going to take you into those, but boy, wow. If you want to find sins of the fathers there, it, it is just leaps off the page at you. I just want to show you how this thing, it, it, it just locks steps. I mean, it absolutely goes right along the way. Let's look at Abraham's family. Ishmael, of course, you know, was a child after the flesh. That was the one, uh, you remember the story, Abraham and Sarah, God got in a bind. He made a promise he couldn't keep. That's always embarrassing for the believers. Find poor old God stuck with a promise he can't keep. And Sarah was like a lot of us, you know, she wanted to get God out of a bind. She, she came up with a dilly of a plan. And so she went to Abraham with her plan. And Abraham, like the dumb men today, go along with such things. So of saying, no, that's not God's plan. That's what he should have said. He went along. He was guilty. Don't blame it all on Sarah. It takes two to tango. And he agreed. And they had the child by the slave woman, you remember? And they had a beautiful, oh, it was lovely. You know, man-made religious plans are always lovely. Oh, we're going to do it this way, and it's going to come out so nice. And it'll get God out of a bind, and because he'd promised the son. You know, Abraham's name, Abram means father. And Abraham, which God changed his name to later, meant father of multitudes or father of nations. When you'd meet somebody walking around out there in the desert, say, hi, what's your name? Father of nations. Oh, how many sons do you have? Well, I don't have any yet. But, you know, God's promised me some. Here he is, getting an old, long, gray beard. No children. What's your name? Father of multitudes. Really? Where are they? You think God hadn't got a sense of humor? He made monkeys and some folks. He's bound to have. So anyway, this is how Abraham and Sarah got off in this little deal with Ishmael, the child of the flesh. Now God said the son of the flesh is not going to inherit. It'll be the, uh, the spiritual son. Now, Ishmael then was the first son. And he was conceived after the flesh. And guess what? The first sons that followed also will be the same way. Esau, son of the father. 
Esau have I hated. Why? Because he was going to be a fleshly son before he's ever born. The sin of the father was going to pass. And Reuben also. Reuben was also passed by. Son of the flesh. All right, now then, Abraham robbed his eldest son, who was Ishmael, of his birthright. So the first sons who followed all lost their birthrights. Sons of the father start repeating. Esau, Reuben, and Manasseh were all eldest sons, and every one of them lost the birthright. Just like clockwork. Abraham forced God's favor on his youngest son. So the youngest sons would be favored in generations that followed. Isaac, Jacob, Benjamin, and Ephraim. It's just as lockstepped as it can be. I mean, sins of the fathers, third and fourth generation, just bang, 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 bang. Just It's just as accurate, just like tick, 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 tock, tick, tock, tick, tock. God's showing us that's one reason this is recorded. Not the only one, but of course, it's, it's one of the reasons. Now, Abraham treated Hagar as a whore. He treated her as a common prostitute. Leah and Dinah were both treated like harlots, and Judah and Jacob engaged in prostitution. Sins of the fathers, it's trailing, them, it's trailing the kids. What the father enjoyed, the children endure. All right, Abraham had two wives, remember? So guess what? Grandson Jacob was forced to have two wives, remember? All right, um, the mother forced out the son Ishmael. Rachel forced that son to leave, the, uh, uh, excuse me, Sarah forced that Ishmael out of the tent. Okay, so guess what? Grandson Jacob is going to be forced to leave by his mother's plot. Remember, Mama teamed up with him to cheat Esau out of the birthright, and she played favorites. That's dangerous. She loved Jacob. It was Mama's boy. And Mama's boy had to flee to Uncle Laban, and Mama never seen him anymore because the time he came back home, she was dead. She, and uh, the child was forced out. This was repeated. By the way, Laban and Jacob, you know, sort of deserved each other. They both crooked the barrel of fish hooks. They crooked each other all the time they were together. Now, um, Sarah, the favored wife, favored the younger son. So in the coming generations, the favored wife would favor the younger son. Check it out. The favored, the favored wife would favor the younger son until finally Benjamin killed his mother in childbirth. Look at ja- uh, the life of Jacob. Jacob, I mean, I'm sorry, the life of Joseph. Jacob was filled with hatred and jealousy for his brother Esau. And he lied to steal the birthright from him. Remember? Lied to his dad. Jacob's sons hated and were jealous of Joseph. And they lied to their dad, and they sold Joseph for money. See it repeating? Jacob's plot forced him to leave home, and his father lost a son for many years. The plot of Jacob's son lost him a son for many years as well. Are you beginning to see how how this thing just repeats and repeats and repeats. All right, Abraham and Lot, uh, because this thing is lockstepping so, I'm going to move to speculation now. These things can be just tied down right in Scripture, Scripture, Scripture. But if this is true, if this is indeed, as I believe it is true, that these things follow exactly, then we may be able to deduce some things from things that happened to Abraham and Lot, for example. Both of them had a common heritage of idolatry, right? Their roots were in idolatry. Now, in idolatry, in an idolatrous land, there's always uncleanness and immorality involved, and this is often results in barrenness of the wives. And it seems significant that the wives of both Abraham and Isaac were barren. All right? Maybe this roots back into the uncleanness in the past. Sometime in the past, maybe sins of the fathers. All right? Idolatry brings famine to a land. That's why you can never feed the hungry. You see all these posters and all these beautiful pictures on TV, poor little children starving to death. We have to feed all these lovely children. You're never going to be able to. Because idolatry and demon worship causes God to smite the land with pestilence, with famine, and with drought. And there is no way that you can ever raise enough food to feed them. Never. The thing, if you really care about the children, we need an army of missionaries who are equipped to do the works of Jesus, to evangelize, to deliver, to heal, and to have the gifts of God operating, the supernatural miracles following, and that will correct the situation. Then God will bless the land, and they'll have enough to eat. That's the only real cure there is. Don't get hoodwinked into these do-gooders, because idolatry produces 
famine, pestilence, and drought. It's a judgment from God, and there's no way. And if you start helping them, God will smite you with judgment also. You just keep messing around. Did you know that? All right. <clears throat> there was famine in the land. It seems uh, idolatry brings famine in the land. And it seems strange that uh, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and Joseph lived in land smitten by famine. Isn't that strange? I, I would be, I'd, I'd venture a guess there are sins of the fathers involved from the past, somewhere back in the past there. Uh, perversion. Lot dwelt in a cities of the plain, Sodom and Gomorrah, among all kinds of sexual perversion. And idolatry, an integral part of idolatry and demon worship is sex perversion. And it's entirely possible that somewhere back in the background there were sins of the fathers concerning idolatry and perversion. And you'll notice his, his daughters learned some cute little tricks too while they were there. And you have, you have Moab and Ammon produced and these men were cruel, vicious haters of God and God's people for everyone. The Moabites and the Ammonites were forever the enemies of God's people. Product of incest. Okay? That's the tenth generation. Yes, the bastard is cursed to the tenth generation. That's 400 years. And by the way, if somebody picks it up and repeats it, then it goes for another one. They had herdsman trouble. Both Lot and Abraham had herdsman trouble. Isn't that strange? Both of them had the same kind of trouble. They had encounters that endangered the wives of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in Genesis 20. Isn't that strange? They were threatened with kidnapping. They were threatened with ransom and all this kind of thing. It's a little odd that it just, a little bit too pat that it just happened. What I just wanted you to see was just get you started, get your brain wheel turning to dig deeper into this. Now, let me talk about you. While I've been talking about this, some of you have been thinking, Oh, good Lord, what was it they said Grandpa did? And what did, what did Granny do? What was that they said about Great Grandpa? Yeah. It does make you pause and think, doesn't it? Now, the thing is, the thing that I find so exciting about this is that God records exactly where the trouble lies. He tells us where the body's buried, but he also tells us how to remedy it. Jesus Christ, in his marvelous, magnificent provision at Calvary, in the sacrifice that he made on Calvary, in his resurrection victory, has provided the power, the ability for the believer to break the iniquities, the whoredoms, and the curses off of themselves and their children. What better thing could you do for yourself, for your children, your grandchildren, than to sit down and say, Lord, where are the bodies buried? And start seeking the Lord to lift these things off. Watch out for recurrent patterns of demonic activity, of adultery, marriage breaking, of lust and uh, stealing, God robbing. As a matter of fact, we have found, uh, in your own case, I would advise you to go and confess these things individually to the Lord. Claim First John 1 John 1.9. Don't hesitate. You have a right to. You are king and priest, a position in Jesus, right? You can claim this for yourself, for your children, for your mate, and break those things and lift them off. And notify Satan, you are lifting the iniquities, the curses, and the whoredoms off of you and your descendants. You're putting a stop to this. No more. I say that's, that's a hallelujah time when you can say this is the end. This is the end of the street. We're cutting her off right here. It went this far. It's made a mess of my family. And if you didn't have a godly heritage, so what? I'm going to give my kids and my descendants a godly heritage. Isn't that great? I just get excited about the Lord because, you know, you present something like this, you know, and some people sit back there and they think, well, gee whiz, my family was a mess. I didn't get nothing. But the rub, you know, I just barely got in, uh, got saved. It's a wonder I even got saved. Everybody else is just a rank heathen. No, it doesn't matter where your heritage lies. You can clean up and stop it here and give a fresh start. And that's our God has made provision in Jesus. And this will make you appreciate Jesus so much more when you really appropriate this for yourself and for your children, for your descendants, for unborn descendants, for those little grandbabies that are coming. Praise the Lord. Just think. And if you made fool mistakes yourself in the past, if your parents did, if your grandparents, your great-grandparents, your great-great-grandparents, you say, well, I don't know of any areas. Well, take the last part of the first chapter of Romans. That'll give you a start. It lists quite a few over there. Chances are you got in, your, your ancestors got in most of it. It has a whole list of rotten stuff. 
If you run out, you might try Galatians over there, the works of the flesh. I think you'll cover pretty well the spectrum. But I will give you this uh, insight. We've, as we've worked with people since we've been working in this area and praying for people in deliverance, often the Lord will say, sins of the fathers. And when he does, many times I'll just say, Lord, I confess the sins of this woman's fathers, her ancestors, of idolatry, witchcraft, lust and uncleanness, unbelief, robbing God. That brings a curse too, you know. And all of those things. And I accept forgiveness in Jesus' name for this. And I lift the curses, iniquities, and whoredoms. That's the three things that are associated with this. Curses, whoredoms, and iniquities. I lift those off of her and off her descendants in Jesus' mighty name. Many times the demons start coming out while you're praying that. If they don't, you can thrash them out later. Either way they get out, it doesn't matter, right? Praise the Lord. I would encourage you to take this and dig further. I've only scratched the surface. I've only got you started. As you go through the families in the Bible, you're going to find many, many more treasures in here. I am convinced that we have only begun to uncover the freedom that God wants us to have. We haven't even begun to know. You see, we're so bound now. You know, if you heard Dr. Haggard years ago when he came out and began to speak about restoration of the mind, that we ought to have the mind of Christ and we ought to all be geniuses, believers. Seems a little far-fetched, but you know, it's true. I had a letter from a young man <clears throat> over in Iowa, and he was uh, going to change his job area, and so he needed to take some kind of a test. He took a test before deliverance, and then later he came to our church, received some pretty massive deliverance, and then got some more deliverance later from some other deliverance workers as well. He wrote me this letter, and he said, Pastor, he said, I, I enclosed this, this uh, test results. I want you to see. He had jumped from the um, his first test before he was delivered. He took the test. He came out on the 22nd percentile, I believe it was. And then after he was delivered, he took the identical same test with no more preparation or anything. He jumped to the 60th percentile. And he said the only difference was deliverance. He said, Pastor, we haven't even begun to scratch the surface on this business of loosing the minds of the believer. You see, if the believer's minds are loose, from the awful bondage and clutter of the demon, they'll be able to think again. They will be able to come up with inventions that will easily get us out of all the problems we're in, energy-wise and ecologically and every other way. There won't be any problem. If God can get the minds functioning, he can put into those minds ingenious inventions that will change the course of history. Doesn't that make sense? When Adam walked in the garden, he had a perfect mind, didn't he? Do you ever think he named everything in the garden? And then when Eve came along, he took her out, he took her around and introduced her to all the animals. Told her what everything was named. And he didn't even have a list. I have to have a list to go to the grocery store, don't you? You know. That shows you how far we have drifted. He didn't have a computer, he didn't have a list, he didn't have anything except his remarkable mind that God had given him. Now you and I are direct descendants of him. But we have so much garbage, so much clutter in our heads. But I don't think that's God's fault, do you? Why does it talk about, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus? Why does it talk about tearing down imagination, pulling down imagination? See, the demonic has had the sway so long. We have inherited all this, and we have accepted it meekly and passively. Well, you know, I'm just not very good at that. Nobody in my family can do that. I'm kind of like my dad, you know. He never could do that either. He never was very good at reading. He never was very good at... She never was good at math. I'm just like her, you know. And we just said, isn't that nice? And the devil said, that's right. Keep speaking and it'll be so. Just sent you down good and tight. And you'll be bound into the track you're putting yourself in. I believe, people, the sins of the fathers is another step forward to get us free. To get out from under the demonic bondage. To get to the place where we can fight freely against the enemy. Now, you have to decide whether it's worth it. There is a penalty. There's a price. The enemy will fight you every step of the way, I promise you that. We do not know near all the answers. We only know a few. But the few we know are working remarkable miracles. And I would encourage you to study, to learn, and to seek God, because he is sending out fresh information all the time. It's not new, because he's known it all the time. 
we're the dullards, we're dragging behind. But he is finding a mind open here, there, and yonder, and he's filling us with information. This man in Hawaii was open, listening to God. He put me on the trail of it. I've been able to spread it all across the country, and people are getting free and freer and freer. And many have reported <coughs> great areas of freedom because of sins of the Father. A fragmented soul was another great breakthrough, putting the soul back together. How many of you know what I'm talking about when I say the fragmented soul? Anybody? Oh, I think we better come down across that tomorrow. Maybe we better review it. That's one of the, that, that. That is a wonderful thing. The soul can be fragmented, but thank God it can be restored. Wow! You talk about something that's a whiz banger, get your soul restored. Your mind can be restored. Your whole soul can be restored. And God purposes us for, for us to have much more than we have. Don't you believe that? He's going to come for a glorious church without spot or wrinkle. Do you know how you take spots out? Strong bleach. You know how you get wrinkles out? Hot iron. Are you sure you want to be in that glorious church? And you get ready for the spot remover and the iron. It's coming. Amen. But wouldn't you rather do that than just burn up daylight for nothing? Wouldn't that be better? After all, you're going to live here 60, 70, 80 years. Then you got eternity to see whether you were a fool or smart. You don't get to think about the rest of your life. Amen? Why not be smart? Find out what God's doing, get on his train, and say, Lord, sink or swim, live or die. Here we go. Amen? That's what I want to do. I would like to know that when I lay the whole life down, I will have done what God told me to do. And I don't have to satisfy anything, anybody but him. You don't either. But you do need to satisfy him. Are you really satisfied with yourself? It'd be good to start learning everything you can to change things and make them right. Amen? God is raising up an army such as the world has never seen before. He's going to raise up an army, and you're going to think it's a great big thing, and he's going to come through like he did with Gideon, and he's going to send her down until there's nothing left. You think, oh, my Lord, we're sunk. We thought we had enough, and now we don't have hardly anything left. Wouldn't you like to have been General Gideon? He didn't want to be no general. He was he was drafted. It wasn't his idea. And he, he said, okay, Lord, rather than disobey you, I'll send the call out. And he sent them out. 32,000 showed up. Well, that's a drop in the bucket compared to that 150, 200,000 over there in the valley, the enemy. He thought, well, Lord, I guess we can just all go out in a glorious charge as they wrap, as they, as they sweep in around us and cut us to ribbons. At least you'll remember somebody died for Jesus, you know. <laughs> I don't think he had much hope, really. And the Lord said, there's too many. He said, wait a minute, wait a minute. Gideon said, oh, good. <laughs> I'm glad you noticed. He thought he was going to call the whole thing off, you know. He said, no, there, there is a problem, Gideon. Yes, sir. Yes, sir, I noticed. He said, yeah, there's too many. Too many? And you remember how he said that? He said, uh, tell everybody you got a bunch of cowards in here. People don't really want to fight. Tell those that don't really want to fight to go home. Those that are scared to fight. Oh, Gideon thought, oh, boy, I thought we were going to lose a bunch. Okay, fellas, any of you that don't really want to fight, you're a coward going home. He knew they wouldn't do that. Yes, they did. 22,000 of them left. I mean, they just, he watched, he couldn't believe his eyes. You mean you're going to admit you're a coward, fella? Mm -hmm. I don't want to fight. I'm peaceful. Listen, I've seen them in the deliverance army, too. Are you afraid to stand? Yes. Goodbye. Out they go. And God said, well, he didn't thought, well, we can make one last charge of the 10,000 we got left. <laughs> we'll go down fighting. They'll cut us to ribbons, of course. They won't even know they run over anything. But a few of us, you know. God said there's still too many. He said, Lord, you've got to be kidding, you know. And you remember how he cut them down to 300? Did you know that was less than 1% of what he started with? And what he started with wasn't enough to bite with. And you know why God said he cut the, cut the rank? He said if there was this many, somebody might brag and say, weren't we great warriors? Oh, Lord, there's no deliverance workers around here but us. <laughs> Hello, Army. Get your picture. Get your torch. You're not supposed to have a bunch. 
Otherwise, they'd say, you had so many, that's why you won. The thing God wants to do is scare the daylights out of the enemy and say, my land, they didn't have anybody, but they won anyway. It has to be the power of God. You've got to get rid of the glory grabbers. Those that grab his glory will never be used. God's not, <laughs> God's not looking for glory grabbers. He's looking for those who have been so trained and schooled in the battle and the warfare that they will automatically, as automatically as they breathe, they will turn and give glory to God and never receive any of it for themselves. And when the devil whisper, comes up to them, whisper, says, My, you're great. And say, Oh, no, I'm not, but say it again. Let me listen to it just one more time. I, I don't believe it, but just, just tickle my ear just one more time. Everybody's got some of that in them. Got to get that out. That's got to go. It's got to go so that your first response is it's Jesus. He's the one. First, last, and always. It, it doesn't depend on me. It depends on him. It's for his glory and his alone. And I'll not give glory to anyone else. Neither will I not let anybody around me do it either. Every revival movement that I've ever studied has gone and aborted because somebody got wrapped up in grabbing for the glory. It's so sad. The outpouring of supernatural wonders came. The outpouring of evangelism, the outpouring of deliverance came. And yet somebody got derailed, stuck on themselves. Felt like they were the ones. They had arrived. As soon as they did, the decline set in. And God's people were robbed to move God. I believe this was going to make it. I really do. Because it's coming from the grassroots. It's coming from God's little people, if you please. It's coming from a heart cry in the hearts of the people for help. Everywhere I go across the country, people come to me and they say, you know, God's been talking to us. And for a while we thought we were crazy because everybody told us we were. We got a hold of your book and we came to one of the meetings. We heard you talking about the same thing that God's been talking to us about. How reassuring that is. Wouldn't it be frightening to be the only one that God was talking to? <coughs> Did you ever thought about how, how lonely Elijah felt? I don't think he ever conferred with the bread and water prophets. The ones that Obadiah had over in the cave. They hadn't bowed the knee to Baal, but they must not have bowed the knee much to God. Elijah never had heard anything about him. He had the message. He said, I, even I alone. We've never had that problem, have we? It's always been somebody. Amen? I believe that it's worthwhile, people, to give you life to this. And somebody has to care because the people, God's people, are bound so horribly. The bondage in the churches is incredible. And the ones that trumpet the most about being free are usually the most bound. The only thing is they're bound with religious cords and they're silk and you can't tell that they're chains. And slaves who love their chains can never be free. If you won't admit you've got a problem, you'll never get free. I would encourage you to be honest with God and just realize, you say, well, I don't have any demons. See, now there's your first problem. You don't have any problems then. Well, you know, I, I do have a few. But they're certainly not demons. And what makes you think they're not? Well, you know, that's terrible to have demons. Well, it may be terrible, but it's very common. It's common as dirt. Don't feel special because you have demons. Feel like you've joined the club. Say, well, I didn't pick up any. Well, you inherited a batch then. You get them by inheritance, by sin, by the occult. Get them by transference. Several different highways they travel on, but you don't have to live under them. He says, well, if I have demons and the devil made me do it, that's a cop-out. You're supposed to whip them. Whip them every day of the week and twice on Sunday. Put them in their place till they'll be glad to leave when it's time to cast them out. That's what we're trying to teach believers to do, is to come to terms with these things and whip them. Whip them on their home ground, then you'll never have to be afraid of them anymore. When they leave, they come back, say, I'm coming back in, you say, oh, shut up. You couldn't hurt, you couldn't bother me when you're inside. I whipped you then. You're sure weaker now than you were then. Don't don't bother me. Go bother somebody that doesn't know any better. God wants His people strong. He wants them to know that the enemy is limited. The devil is not invincible. His demons are not unbeatable. We've got to prove this true in our lives, and then we've got to carry the message to the body of Christ while there's yet time. We're still in critical time. The crisis has not passed, but we are gaining. There's no doubt about it. We've gained time already. The enemy is squawking his head up. And the whole program has been messed up. And they really don't know what's going to happen now, but they're kind of frightened. 
I even pinned the principality about a while back, since the ball, and I said, we're going to have that avalanche of deliverance, aren't we? Across the whole nation. He said, no. I said, will that answer stand the judgment? He said, no, 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 you know it won't. It's coming, but we'll fight you. We'll fight you every step of the way. <laughs> I said, good, there's nothing like a good fight. They'll fight us, people, but they're already conceding it's coming. That's good. There's a sound of a going in the mulberry. God is moving, and he's going to have his way. He's going to glorify his son. He's going to exalt him above this filthy world system, and he's going to show the enemy for what he is. What all lies ahead, I'm not quite sure. I'm just simply saying we need to get into the battle now, engage the enemy, and whip the daylights out of him and prepare for whatever God wants to do. If we're in spiritual warfare, we'll be tuned up when he says, G, we'll G, and when he says, haul, we'll haul. Amen? When he said, giddy up, we'll charge. When he says, whoa, we'll stop. Spiritual warfare is the best tune-up I know to get you moving. Praise the Lord. Father in heaven, according to Leviticus 26, you have commanded us to confess the sins of our fathers and our forefathers, even back to four generations. And we recognize, Lord, that tonight, Men and women, boys and girls are here whose fathers, grandfathers, great-grandfathers, great-great-grandfathers have been involved in various kinds of sins. Their ancestors have passed on sins and ancestral curses to these people. And because we believe the promises in your word, we confess the sins of idolatry, the sins of witchcraft, the sins of unbelief, the sins of lust, incest, child abuse, broken marriages, we confess the sins of God-robbing and unbelief, we confess all these wickednesses and abominations before you, Father, and we receive, in Jesus' name, because of 1 John 1, 9, complete forgiveness and cleansing from these sins on behalf of all these people present who are participating. And now we lift the sins, the iniquities, the curses, off of these people, the whoredoms, off of these people that came because of sins of the fathers, we accept it and we lift it off of them in Jesus' mighty name. Thank you, Father. Praise your wonderful name for the wonderful provision you've made in Jesus Christ for all of our needs. Amen. Anything else, Graham? If you want to stay and receive prayer or something, you can. If you want a fellowship, uh, fine. I'm going to be praying with people for a while. If you're not familiar with the Dover's, you want to watch it? I have no objection to you gathering around where I'm praying. I don't know of any worker who minds. But please, if you're going to be there, just be quiet. Don't yell, okay? We don't yell at the demons. They're not deaf. This is the end of this message. Our website is www.lakehamiltonbiblecamp.com. There are many free audio files there. It's like going to Bible school at home. Thank you.